Uh, I'm very happy to uh, have a talk today by Bogdan Sezevsky and by Riza Nikandish from uh, UCD in Dublin. Uh, let me first uh, introduce our speakers of today. So Riza is an assistant professor at University College Dublin in Ireland, and his research interests include millimeter wave circuits and systems for wireless communications and sensing, CMOS quantum computing, and AI hardware. Next, we have Bogdan. Bogdan Sezevsky received all his three electrical engineering degrees from the University of Texas at Dallas in 1991, 92, and 2002. He spent 20 years in high tech industry in the US, the last 14 of them in Texas Instruments, Dallas, Texas, where he invented and popularized all digital phase lock loops. He moved to academia in 2009, joining Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. In 2014, he moved to University College Dublin in Ireland, where he is teaching mixed signal and RF IC design. He is a co-founder of a startup company, Equal One Labs, which aims to produce single chip CMOS quantum computers. So by that, I'm happy to um, give the word to Riza, who is going to deliver the first part of this presentation. After that, we'll have a short Q&A. We also switch speakers and then we will give the word to Bogdan. But first, Riza, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so could you enable uh, sharing option for me? Okay, so uh, uh, Riza, Riza, yeah. we are we are seeing your presenter view. Would it be possible to show the 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 slide only? Okay. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So thank you everyone for your time. Today we are going to have a presentation about um, quantum computer uh, SEMA system and chip. So I would like to invite you to an exciting journey. This is about the future of quantum computers and their implementation as a SEMA system and chip. So we believe that currently we are at the stage that is uh, similar to the stage of wireless com communication in early 2000. So when the IC designers started uh, thinking about how to design radio using CMOS technology, so they have a dream of uh, making uh, Bluetooth or GSM radio using CMOS. So they face many challenges, but um, after proposing many ideas on circuit and system level, they were able to realize the systems that currently are uh, uh, working uh, in many practical applications. So we believe that uh, quantum computers also are at some similar stage. And so the purpose of this talk is to summarize some of the previous uh, developments that are um, can be considered as a foundation for this new vision. So here we have an outline of our presentation. After having an in short introduction and fundamentals of uh, qubits, we will uh, discuss about technologies that are used as to implement uh, qubits or um, quantum bits. We discuss different paradigms of quantum computers, quantum gate, their interface with uh, and classic uh, world, and we'll discuss the paradigm of uh, quantum uh, CMOS system on chips. And um, after that, we will briefly review some of recent developments in equal one labs, and we uh, go to conclusion. So here uh, you can see, uh, some uh, most important applications that uh, rely on high-performance computing. 
Currently, quantum computing is uh, in a transition stage from science to engineering. We know that quantum computing has been around for many years, but just recently, uh, the new approach to uh, engineering of quantum computers toward the goal of fabricating a practical quantum computer has started. So, this, uh, if uh, such a system can be fabricated, uh, it can provide a revolution of in many important applications, for example, in AI, in, uh, in big data imaging and cryptography, you can uh, expect a huge uh, advancement if we can have a quantum computer. Here you can see uh, uh, different levels of uh, government in investments in quantum area around the world. So as you can see, multi-billion investment by government has been uh, considered for research, development, and educational purposes in uh, quantum engineering. So some interesting examples are including include China, which based on this uh, information has considered $10 billion for research in this area. So this is uh, way higher than what has been considered by US, uh, which is around $1.2 billion. And you can see also other companies, that, uh, other uh, countries, and the amount of their investment in this area. There are different quantum players in uh, different aspects of quantum computing, including software, uh, hardware, and enabling technologies. You can see that there are some big names and big companies that have been active in classical, in classical, quantum, uh, classical computers, currently have moved to do some activities on quantum computing, and also there are uh, many uh, new startups active in this area. So this shows that this area is is becoming very hot, and there are many uh, companies uh, that in through recent years uh, are attracted, and in future years will be active in this area. So we can expect uh, uh, much more faster development in quantum computing. So now let's uh, briefly review some of the fundamentals that um, learn what is quantum computing and what is it about. Fortunately, we don't need to uh, be a quantum physicist. To understand quantum computers, just uh, similar to the case that I uh, describe as an example in the area of um, uh, fabricating radios using CMOS technology, having just some uh, basic knowledge of uh, quantum, compu uh, quantum computing would be enough to uh, start in involving in quantum computing. So uh, first, let's see what is a qubit or quantum bit. We know that classic bits can uh, be only in one of two logical states, zero and zero or one at a time. But qubits can be in both of two quantum states, zero and one at the same time. So soon you will understand what does it mean. So we can say that uh, these two states are fundament, uh, fundamental quantum states, and the state of qubit is kind of a statistical parameter that it has a probability of having zero, a stationary probability of having zero and a stationary probability of having one. Okay, so it is mathematical description. So currently, in your mind, you may have this question: What happens to this system? So why this system is statistical? Which kind of hardware is going to implement a statistical system? Something that it should be clear that in the next few slides. Uh, quantum uh, bits or qubits have some uh, specific properties which make them different with uh, classical bits. One of them is superposition. Superposition says that a qubit state can be described as superposition of two basic quantum states, zero and one. So it means that uh, if we look at here, it's shown by uh, psi, it is a linear uh, superposition of two basic quantum states and two A and B constants uh, satisfy the condition that uh, square root of their magnitude A a squared plus b squared is one. So it shows that the quantum state can be represented on a surface of a sphere. This is called a block sphere, right? As you can see, we have a node. We can under this sphere, we can consider two quantum, two pure quantum states, zero as north of north pole of the sphere and one as a south pole. So every point on the surface of this um, sphere can be described by two angles. In elevation, theta, and azimuth phi, right? So this is a, a state of that qubit. This representation would be helpful to understand uh, some quantum operation. Another important uh, feature of a qubit 
is an entanglement. So we can say that one qubit can share its state with other separated qubits in the state. Right, so for example, in this figure, we can consider two qubits which are entangled, so they can operate like a single particle. So when you do a measurement on one of them to measure its state, the state of another one will be immediately known, irrespective of their uh, physical distance. So it is a special property of qubits which helps to realize very high speed communication, which are beyond the level of uh, classical communication. So of course, we can imagine that there are uh, many uh, implementation challenges in the realization of such a system, but as we can understand their fundamental properties and um, their potential, it will be motivation to start tackling uh, uh, implementation challenges. So the qubits operation is extremely fragile, and they are sensitive to noise and disturbance from the external world. And so quantum computer needs kind of um, protection from external world so that it can maintain its proper operation. So uh, in order to have a better understanding of quantum compute, uh, um, quantum gates, so we start by a simple example here. So we know classical inverter, it can transform zero and one to each other, so we can describe it by a simple function, but for quantum uh, inverters, because uh, the qubit state is represented on a, a sphere, on a surface of a sphere, so we can have three different types of inverters. For example, you can see in the first example here, we have an inverter that transforms one and zero to each other, right? So if uh, our state is on uh, South Pole, it will be converted to North Pole and uh, vice versa. So, but uh, there is a point that this is, for any point on the, on a upper, uh, semi-sphere uh, is uh, reflected to another one in the lower and in the reverse uh, direction. So it is called a uh, Pauli X uh, gate, right? So this is one of the uh, inverters that we can have in quantum domain. We can also consider two other um, quantum gates, Y and Z. In terms of uh, matrix representation, we have this option to uh, represent uh, quantum gates as mat uh, matrices. If we consider one and zero quantum states as vectors, so uh, you can see we can have three type of um, quantum polygates as inverters, and their um, operation is described by a two by two matrix. So there are some textbooks, uh, standard and classic textbooks, and new one. So we can refer to them for further information and a detailed uh, description of a variety of quantum gates and, and their uh, representation. So here we just wanted to have a feeling that how quantum gate uh, operate compared to classical gate. So we say that a quantum gate can be described by a matrix. So if uh, in, uh, a state of input qubit is psi i, the, in, the state of output qubit would be described by this uh, matrix uh, operation. Or in a block sphere, we can describe uh, effect of a quantum gate by a combination of rotation on azimuth and elevation uh, direction, right? So here, for example, you can see three types of uh, rotation, right? Uh, along the X axis, Y and Z axis, right? And you can see how uh, the state of a qubit can evolve as a specific um, rotation is applied. So this is based on one of based on a publication from our group research. So uh, here we just show it as, a, as an example to see how quantum state can be changed by different type of rotation. And uh, okay, so, so far we learned about qubits, we learned about quantum gates. The next level after having quantum gates would be quantum circuit. Quantum circuit realizes specific function on input, input qubits. Right, and by having multiple uh, quantum circuits, we can realize a quantum algorithm. So here you can see an example of a um, quantum circuit, which has um, this input qubit state, right? As you can see, we have some uh, different kind of uh, quantum gate, right? For example, Z is a inverter, 
right, that we discussed before. We have our X rotation around the X axis by pi over two. And so far we have some control gates, right? We have some control gates. For example, this qubit state is used to control operation of the control Z gate. So later you will learn that this is called C not gate, control C not gate. And here we have some readout, right? A state of every of this qubit can be read out here and based on and the results, a final state can be uh, extracted. Just this is an example to show how we can have this hierarchy of step by step, having qubits, quantum gates, quantum circuits, and finally implementing the quantum algorithm. So after this uh, brief mathematical review, we can go to technology and you see that how qubits can be physically implemented. Here we have an overview of uh, most uh, popular qubit technologies, including uh, superconducting loop, trap ions, uh, silicon quantum dots, topological qubits, and diamond vacancies. So each of these uh, technologies has some um, advantage and some issues. There are some limitations on their operation, and some of important companies, some big companies are working on, that on different type of qubits. For example, for semiconductors, you can see Google, IBM, and D-Wave, are active in this area for uh, silicon quantum dots, Intel, QTEC, and Leti are some of examples that are active. So here we have an overview of different type of qubits. But what is important for us and is a focus of this talk is um, silicon quantum dots. We'll see that this silicon quantum dot has the potential to be implemented using a uh, CMOS technology, which is a popular and technology for implementation of integrated circuit in side the circuit and community. So here we, we are going to have a review of uh, different stages that we need to understand to realize a quantum computer based on um, quantum dots. But before that, let's uh, briefly review the current state of development in commercial quantum computers. So the first example is IBM uh, superconducting quantum computer, right? So it is a co uh, commercial quantum computer using transmon qubits. They are type of uh, superconducting qubits. They are controlled by microwave signals. As you can see, there is a very complicated circuit structure here that should be used to interact with qubits. So interact with qubits means uh, we need to read and write the state of qubits. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, superconducting qubits needs to be cooled down on the level of milli Kelvin so that they can uh, maintain their properties. Having such a cooling system is um, is a big challenge. As you can see, size of the system is very large, right? This is from IBM Q project. The size of such a system is very large, right? And it consumes a lot of uh, power. So the system is not scalable to very large number of qubits. So what is very large, you should see. Here we have another example, a Google uh, superconducting quantum computer that recently they used to achieve a milestone so-called uh, supermassive. So um, we are not going to go through details of this uh, milestone, its uh, uh, sufficiency and its issues, but just here we have an example again. So in this uh, Google Supermassive experiment, uh, programmable superconducting qubits have been used. The system has uh, 54 transmon qubits. Again, as you can see, the size, of, the size of system is very large, right? You can see here, the size of system is very large. So mainly for cooling uh, the qubits and so that they can have a good uh, performance. And the system is not easily scalable, right? So if you want to scale it to a uh, higher level of a higher number of qubits we will have big issues to the size of this system here we have uh, the last example it's a d-wave quantum computer d-wave is a canadian company perhaps one of the first companies that uh, the, uh, fab uh, fabricated a quantum computer and were uh, was able to sell their product so these quantum computers are based on quantum annealers, means that they are not universal quantum computers. They cannot fabricate any, or uh, they cannot implement any arbitrary quantum algorithms. So they can be used for a specific application. 
again, as you can see, the size of system is a big issue here, right? The size of system is a big issue. So you cannot imagine that such a system can be scaled to a level that can be uh, used for um, many commercial applications. So, uh, so far we uh, discussed three uh, examples of um, past commercial quantum computers. Uh, in general, these, these, uh, all of these quantum computers are based on a paradigm that qubits are maintained at millikelvin temperature range, range and control, controller is at room temperature, 300 Kelvin. Such a system needs very high cooling power because uh, maintaining qubits at millikelvin needs uh, too much cooling, uh, too high level of uh, cooling power, and the system is not easily scalable. If we want to have too many qubits, we have we'll have another issue uh, for interfacing with qubits. So we call it I/O crowding, right? So it means that we need too many in, uh, lines to interface each of these qubits. So the size of the system would be very large, and such a system is not scalable. So it typically can be used to fabricate system on the range of 50 to 100 qubits, which is not uh, enough for having a practical quantum computer. So this is the past paradigm of quantum computers. So similar to uh, Moore's law, we have a, a rule for a scaling of quantum computers. So this is um, proposed by uh, van der Seypen in ISSC 2017. Right, so here we have the number of qubits and the scaling trend uh, versus time. So in this linear line, you can see the current scaling trend, right, based on uh, activities that uh, is performed. You can see that uh, it will take several decades so that we can reach a level of usefulness for quantum computers. So it is discussed that in order to have a practical quantum computer, which is able to solve some realistic, useful problems, not just only uh, have some supermassy over classic quantum computers, have a, have a practical value, you need to have uh, something around 1 million qubits in your system. So based on current scaling trend, it will take several decades to reach such a system. So we need a new disruptive approach to realize the practical quantum computer so that it can be able to realize uh, during the current decade. So we, uh, here we have, our, we have uh, the present paradigm of quantum computers, right? So as you can see, uh, qubits are, stayed, are still at millikelvin temperature range, 20 to 100 millikelvin, but the, uh, main difference compared to uh, past uh, approach is that uh, the contour circuits are uh, moved from room temperature to 4 Kelvin, to cryogenic. And currently they are implemented using CMOS technology because CMOS has shown the potential to implement uh, passive and active circuits uh, at, and that which are effectively operating at cryogenic temperature. So there are many activities in this area many uh, admirable works are done and published in, in top um, uh, side state um, community uh, conference and journal. But uh, still, there are some issues with this approach. So first of all, uh, still, we need high cooling power. We should, again, we need to maintain qubits at uh, millikelvin range. So if we want to have 1,000 of qubits, we can easily estimate uh, the power consumption of such a system. So even though, the system is uh, partially scalable, but the still some of the issues has not been fully solved. The size of system would be large, and this scalability is limited, perhaps for a uh, limited number of qubits, or what is um, called in quantum computing uh, community, what is called as NISC era. So, um, so the system is not fully a scalable to a level of a practical quantum computer. Here, we can see that the size of system, again, that is used here, you can see uh, this is a typical uh, cooling system, right? As you can see, the upper state is six, uh, 60, kel 60 Kelvin, for example. And as, as we go down, we can uh, gradually uh, achieve the low, lower temperature range until we get the 
20 to 100 millikelvin required for this qubit. So as you can see, we have this issue, the size of the system is very big. And here we have this uh, connections, right? Connections from qubits to their um, controller part, right? So as you can see, if the number of qubits, you want to have 1000 of qubits here, so we'll have issue in this system. So we need to have a disruptive new paradigm. So here is a, is a possible and disrupting future paradigm for quantum computers, which we uh, move uh, qubits to higher um, higher temperature of four Kelvin. Uh, still, we are at cryogenic temperature, but uh, you will uh, you will see that it can uh, provide huge difference because when qubits are operated at four Kelvin in a state of one hundred millikelvin, the cooling power that is required to implement them would be much lower. Another advantage is that because both of qubits and their uh, controller circuits are operating at the same temperature, they can be co-integrated on a single uh, CMOS chip, right? So we will, so in this way, we have fixed the I/O crowding issue. So the lower cooling power, highly scalable because we know that uh, CMOS can be implemented in a compact area, right? So we can have a high yield. And the system has potential for uh, achieving a quantum computer with uh, too many qubits. Of course, there are many challenges in implementation of such a system, but this is a vision that we believe it has uh, value to be pursued in the state of uh, present paradigm of quantum computers because it, it has potential for achieving a higher level of um, integration and ha having a um, practical quantum computer. Again, uh, similar to the issue, uh, similar to a state that we had in early 2000, that uh, we say that um, uh, radio systems were designed using uh, RFIC techniques. Initially, they didn't have good performance. Uh, so, for example, Bluetooth or GSM uh, uh, radios that were reported on that time, they had uh, good performance, high power consumption. But through the years, as research continued on that area, uh, so many new circuit architectures, many transmitter and trans receiver architectures were developed. Circuit techniques help to improve performance and reduce power consumption. So we believe that in this area, we also are, are at the same stage. So after several years, we, stayed, we expect that the system, uh, this quantum computer system can be realized and achieve uh, a good performance that is acceptable as a practical quantum computer. So one of the reasons that we think such a system the scale level is a comparison that you can see here we have in the left we have a typical cooling system which can provide a temperature on the range of millikelvin its size is like on the order of two s3 room but if we uh, can increase the temperature on four kelvin so we can use a, a cooling system on the size of a desktop pc right so as you can see we can if uh, such a system can be fabricated we can even have a dream of, uh, you can think about a dream of having a personal quantum computer. So this can provide a breakthrough in many applications. If you can have a quantum computer as a small size system, not necessarily the same quality of uh, this big system, but uh, having more number of qubits and smaller size. So many new applications can benefit from such a system. So the question though is that uh, how an IC designer can contribute in uh, quantum computing revolution. So of course, you don't need to understand all aspects of um, quantum computing. So there are some fundamental concepts that are necessary to involve in this area. So the first concept is quantum dots, which are uh, semiconductor nano scale particles, which has um, which have a specific electrical and optical properties due to quantum mechanical effects. Current non-scale CMOS transistors, for example, currently uh, it is easy to imagine the technology with um, feature size of 20 nanometer. Can we realize quantum dots? That's a big difference compared to old technology. And such, quant such quantum dots um, are normally operated at cryogenic temperatures, for example, less than four Kelvin to maintain their quantum properties. 
So in order to involve in this area, you need to learn how to uh, design and fabricate and operate such a quantum drive. So here we have a classic uh, quantum physics problem. Uh, we have an electron confined in a quantum bell with a finite uh, wall potential. So the problem is to find the probability of uh, presence of electron in a specific area inside the wall, right? Inside the uh, inside the well or outside of the well. So uh, the solution to this problem is um, electron wave function, uh, which can be derived um, by solving the Schrödinger equation. Right, so here we have a Schrodinger equation, and by applying proper boundary conditions for voltage, and we can derive this this psi, which is wave function, and this wave function, it's um, it is this, the probability of finding electron in a specific range uh, is related to integral of this uh, wave function squared, right? And also there are some specific properties which are uh, features of quantum physics. For example, electron cannot have a continuous range of energy, but uh, it has only uh, discrete energy levels, which are dependent on some phys physical parameter, the uh, length of this uh, veil or uh, mass of electron. So here we can see uh, this uh, phi squared as a function of position for some uh, values of um, for some levels of uh, electron energy. So what is important here and is a fundamental of uh, uh, building quant uh, qubits using quantum dot is that we can see that this uh, psi function is non-zero outside of the well, right? There is a non-zero probability here. So it, it is something that is completely uh, different with classical uh, mechanics. So as you can see, in this electron has a probability of uh, passing through the wall. So this um, this phenomena is called quantum tunneling. This tunneling is important uh, feature uh, in fabricating qubits using quantum dot. So you can control this, uh, this probability by controlling this voltage level, right? By controlling this voltage level, we can control the probability of tunneling. So uh, a double quantum dot can be used to realize a qubit. As we can see here, we have a double quantum dot. It has two bells, right? Uh, two uh, wall potential and a barrier potential. So you can uh, you can imagine that, uh, if, for example, you can define qubit state based on a spin or charge of electrons in quantum dot, or for example, based on their position. For example, we can say that if uh, electron is in the left well, so we say that this qubit is in at zero state, quantum state. If it is at right well, we can say that the qubit is in uh, one quantum state. So this architecture has is very popular in uh, physics community. Uh, several methods are developed in, for initialization, manipulation, and result of uh, the qubit. So these are three fundamental functions which are required that uh, a qubit can be used as a uh, fundamental element of a quantum computer. So for example, now we want to see um, some examples how uh, qubit can be implemented based on charge or spin qubit. So the first we can we look at an example that a dual, uh, double quantum dot is used as a charge qubit. So in this stage, you can see a physical implementation here. Right, so you can see we have a structure that has some gates here. So these gates are, are shown by G, right? Some gates here. We have a contact of grain and source, and we have two quantum dots which are constructed here, okay? So uh, by controlling this voltage, VL, VB, and VR, look at this figure here, we can control the level of barriers, right, between, uh, quantum dots and their uh, source or uh, drain terminals, and also the, uh, the tunneling barrier between two qubits. For example, by controlling VL, you can control the number of electrons inside this, in this uh, quantum uh, dot. Or by controlling VB, you can control this potential barrier, which means uh, you can control 
and the probability of and exchanging electron between the two dots. So we can assign, uh, for example, zero quantum state when electron is present in the left quantum dot, or we can assign one when uh, it is in the right quantum dot. And this structure has been implemented at low uh, temperature, it's uh, 100 millikelvin. We can use a similar structure uh, to fabricate a spin qubit. So the spin qubit uh, is defined based on the spin of electrons in, in the two dots. So here you can see another structure. Again, we have a left and right, um, right, uh, right uh, gates. It, they, they can be used to control the number of electrons in the two dots, right? You can see by controlling this L and R. We can control the number of electrons into um, quantum dots. And we have a gate, a center gate here, which by changing the voltage applied to this gate, we can move this uh, energy level, which means that we somehow can control amount of interaction between two electrons. So here we have we, uh, we define quantum state based on the spin of qubit. So for example, um, we can assign the zero quantum state to the condition that both uh, quantum both uh, quantum dots are spin down, or we can de and define uh, one quantum state when in the when it's in, electron in the left uh, it has a spin up, and the electron in the in the right has a spin down. So this is uh, this is one of the too many possible encodings for uh, realizing uh, quantum state. There is an essential difference between uh, this spin qubit and previous um, charge qubits. You can see we have external magnetic field that should be applied to this structure. This is necessary for uh, operation of uh, spin qubits to have this external magnetic field. So here we are not going to go through the detail, but it's something that is necessary to split uh, quantum states. Then we have uh, we have used spins to control the qubit state. So, uh, so far, we studied several architectures. So you may ask how this is related to CMOS. Are these ar architectures com compatible with CMOS? Well, to be accurate, we should say no, they are not uh, exactly compatible but with CMOS. But we can we will see that as research has continued in, into this area, some simplified architecture for qubit has been suggested that they let to implement um, qubit using CMOS technology. So we have explored uh, different uh, structures, so you can see some of them, which are candidate for uh, CMOS implementation. So uh, if you are interested, you can go through the details. Uh, but here we just want to uh, study some of uh, the simplest uh, structures. So uh, a simplified double quantum dot structure can which can be simplified, which can be implemented using CMOS technology is shown here. So as you can see, this is a quantum dot array. We have some gates and some wells, and only we have a control voltage on the gate, which control um, control tunneling barrier between two wells. So if you consider, for example, part of this structure, you can, you can by controlling this voltage, you can change uh, the probability of electron moving from one well to another one. Such, an such a structure needs an injector and detector. So this injector means that we have an element to inject electron into the left well, right? And detector read the presence of electron in the right well. So this is our double quantum dot, this kind of extended double quantum dot. And here you have an array, so there is no limit on the number of um, quantum dots which can be connected together through this uh, tunneling barrier. Right here we have a quantum dot array simulated in com console uh, environment. Right, you can see that uh, these gates are modeled as 3D structure. The substrate is defined, and other simulations which are uh, necessary to realize. Uh, such a structure as a cube. So here, depending on uh, how we control this structure, we can have a charge or a spin qubit. So in, in the case of a spin qubit, we need to apply a magnetic field, but for charge, we can control it using the only uh, electrostatic uh, excitation. 
So here we have a little bit of details how quantum state is defined. So we say that in this state, in this structure, by changing this uh, barrier uh, voltage, we can move up and down this, uh, this energy level between two qubits, and we can control their interaction. So if electron is uh, localized in the left uh, well, we, we say that the qubit is um, um, qubit is in the zero state. If it is in the right, we can say that qubit is in one state. And there are some conditions that there is a uh, occupancy oscillation or Rabi oscillation. So in this condition, there is a we can say there is a probability of 50% of presence of electron in left and 50% in the right. And here also we can see some uh, this phi function and this psi function level, which shows probability of finding electron in the left and right. So if you are interested in further information, you can refer to this reference from our group. And so there is an interesting property <coughs> that uh, this kind of qubit can be implemented using a fully depleted SOI or FDSOI CMOS process. As you can see, this FDSOI uh, has a specific feature. It has a thin barrier oxide insulator or something which is called box layer. This box layer isolates, as you can see here, this box layer isolate the ch uh, silicon channel from the substrate. You know that the substrate is a source of many issues, loss, leakage for transistors. For example, in millimeter wave uh, circuits, the substrate, when the substrate is isolated from the channel, we can expect that um, loss of these devices be improved. So here in the case of qubits, uh, this box layer helps to improve quant quantum confinement and somehow uh, reduce uh, detrimental effects of uh, this substrate on operational qubits. So in uh, our research activities, uh, the 22 FDX pro um, process from Global Foundries has been used to uh, and design and fabricate uh, uh, CMOS qubits. Another example uh, which was recently developed is a is a qubit uh, that is implemented using uh, industry as the standard SOI process. So as you can see in this uh, structure here, we have a two gate uh, device. It's a two gate uh, P-type transistor. So one of the gates is used as a whole spin qubit. Right here we have a quantum dot. And another one is used as uh, used to for qubit readout. So by using this one, we can uh, read the state of qubit. By applying proper microwave uh, volt, uh, microwave signal to this state, we can control the state of um, a qubit. And we, we can read the uh, uh, state from uh, this uh, drain and source current, right, in the amplifier here. So what is interesting about this structure, it's uh, very similar to a standard uh, FDSOI CMOS process. As you can see, there is a box layer, Right. So uh, for the experiment that is um, proposed and that is um, reported in this paper, we have been able to achieve a decoherence type of six, 16 nanosecond, and uh, this, uh, the result has been achieved at 10 millikelvin. So what is um, interesting with this as our structure, as uh, I mentioned, this is compatible with CMOS technology, and you can see that it doesn't need to have too many too many gates uh, and control voltage, right, as you can see, by having only two gate, two gate control, they have been able to fabricate a qubit, right? So this is a, a great, a great, improve, great achievement in this area. And just there are some, for example, that the next steps would be to show how this qubit uh, operate at four Kelvin. If you increase the temperature, normally, and the performance of qubit will degrade. So we need to prove that it is feasible at four Kelvin. So far, we discussed two types of qubits, spin and charge. So they both can be used for large scale quantum computing. <clears throat> so uh, a question would be how to compare them. Uh, in, in traditionally, a spin qubit has received more attention in, in physics community because uh, they have a superior performance, mainly the uh, 
uh, recurrent time is longer, but uh, when they have considered a standalone com component, this is scientific research. In engineering work, we need to think about a larger scale quantum computer. So other considerations can be even more important than recurrent time. For example, how qubits interact with its control and regard circuit is very important, how it is sensitive to noise, how it is sensitive to any disturbance and is coming from control circuits. So uh, <clears throat> other aspects should be considered. Also, we can uh, use hybrid spin charge qubits, which can uh, benefit from advantage of both qubit types. Here we have tried to have a comparison on spin and charge qubits and also hybrid qubits. So for example, decoherence time, of course, in spin qubits uh, is longer, but for operational, operational speed, charge qubit is faster. So and depending on the uh, application, we, this feature we, can be more important for us. Here we have also some other performance metrics like sensi sensitivity to noise, which um, qubits are sensitive to charge noise, spins are sensitive to spin noise, while this sensitivity to charge noise is uh, more serious and it is more source of issue in charge qubit. By using a hybrid qubit, we can benefit from uh, this advantage of a spin qubit. Quality of inter-qubit coupling, which is important to realize quantum gate is weak for a spin qubit, or it is strong for charge qubit. That's another advantage of using charge qubit. Uh, their read and write access for a spin qubit is like RF, which is slow, but for charge qubit is the faster. High temperature operation is very important, as uh, I discussed, uh, in order to uh, go towards a, a spin mass and quantum uh, uh, system and chip quantum computer. We need to show that qubits are operating at 4 Kelvin. Currently, there are some uh, claims of uh, operating uh, spin qubits around 1 Kelvin and some for charge qubits around 4 Kelvin. So these claims need to be uh, fully proved. And this is one of the most important milestones toward implementation of CMOS quantum computer. So if you use a hybrid, we can again benefit, of, benefit from both worlds, have something on 1 to 4 Kelvin. And at the end, interaction of qubits with their control and real circuit is very important, especially when the structure is for a larger scale system. So we have seen that uh, spin qubits are operating at RF and microwave frequencies. So it means that we need to have design and uh, cryogenic RF ICs to control uh, and, read, uh, and read their states. But for charged qubits, they can operate at lower frequencies, say less than one gigahertz, such a system can be realized as an analog and mixed signal circuit. Typically, power consumption of uh, charged qubit controllers should be lower than spin qubit. Again, this needs further proof. And so this is a, another advantage for realizing a larger scale quantum computer. But it's, at this stage, I'm not going to draw any conclusion in favor of any type of qubit. So this is here just to revisit what we know about spin and charged qubit and have this uh, as an open question for uh, future research. And so after talking about um, qubits, we need to uh, think how to realize a quantum gate. So in order to fabricate a quantum gate, you should know how to provide a, a specific type of interaction between spin and charge qubits. So three types of interaction are popular in community. So we have electrostatic interaction. We have two double quantum dots, which uh, by controlling their distance and perhaps having a gate here, we can control the amount of interaction between them. We have another type of uh, interaction, which is called exchange interaction, right? Two qubits are encoded using, uh, for example, three quantum dots and their interaction can be controlled using uh, some um, time pulses. So by controlling duration of this uh, interaction, we can implement different type of gates. And a third option, or one of the most popular one, is the array of coupled quantum dots, which we can see by controlling voltage applied to each of these gates, we can control the state of qubits and realize different type of quantum gates. In the literature, presently some uh, CMOS qubits are reported, right? So here we have some differences. 
which claim that they have fabricated CMOS qubits, but unfortunately, we cannot see any comprehensive measurement uh, that is necessary to prove these qubits are actually working. And so, for example, what are their performance metrics and what is needed to uh, realize the quantum computer? So, the last is, our last stage would be talking about um, redox circuits for a spin and charge qubits. For example, for charge qubits, we start by charge qubits. Charge qubit can be uh, the reader can be direct using charge sensor, right? A charge sensor is integrated with the qubit structure on the same chip. For example, a quantum point in contact can be used for this charge sensing. And using an amplifier, you can read this current. So the, the current this current can be different when uh, when electron is present in left or right qubit, and in so you can read the state of qubit. So it is a very brief um, description. The frequency can be low, so you can implement this result using a uh, weak signal circuit, and your power consumption and chip area is lower in CMOS technology. So here we have read that, uh, popular readout circuit for a spinning qubit. Just briefly mentioned two types, RF reflectometry and single shot readout. In, this, in both of these circuits, a magnetic field is required. Frequency of readout circuit is typically two, 2 to 20 gigahertz, right, in the range of RF and millimeter, uh, RF and, and microwave circuit. So we expect to have higher loss and larger chip area in CMOS implementation. Um, and then we have uh, large scale architectures. We can use an array of two dimensional array of quantum dots. So here we have a, a crossbar or DRAM-like dense qubit array. So by applying proper voltage to uh, column and rows of this structure, we can control qubit stage and their interaction with each other. We have another option, a sparse array, which is basically an array of sub-arrays. The qubits are divided to smaller arrays and the structure is less dense, but it provides uh, opportunity to have better control and less coupling within control lines on different uh, sets of and uh, different sub arrays of qubits. And so, uh, so far we, re we reviewed some of the previous works which were not specifically developed for this uh, CMOS quantum computer, but here we have some brief um, results of uh, our research activities here. So I just just briefly uh, introduce them here. We have a, we have two uh, quantum dot arrays that have interaction through electrostatic coupling, right? And this electrostatic coupling can be used to control um, operation of this, uh, this array or uh, the type of uh, quantum uh, operation that is implemented using this structure. So for further detail, you can refer to the reference here. Here we have a simulation results. The system is uh, modeled in COMSOL. And you can see we have different uh, layers of this structure are imported there and simulations are performed to the uh, operation of this structure. So how this interaction can be controlled and how operation of qubit can be properly controlled by applying proper gate um, pulses to this gate. And here we have a we have a, a cheap photo of uh, of the structure that is fabricated using global foundries to a two nanometer FDS CMOS process. Uh, the quantum core is co-integrated with its uh, control and radar circuit, and it is implemented in twenty two FDX process. So here we can see this DAC circuit, for example, are used to control. Uh, the uh, pulses which are applied to the gate of this quantum dot and our uh, radar circuit and other drug generators and other part of circuit which are necessary to have a full quantum computer. So, uh, so I, I summarize what we had in this discussion. So the vision is that current CMOS technologies can provide all elements required to realize a, a practical quantum computer or affordable quantum computer for uh, personal applications. But there are several milestones which should be 
considered in future uh, in this area. So first, the first one is implementation of high quality qubits in the standard CMOS processes. We need to have a more accurate cryogenic modeling of transistors in foundry models. And we need a development of simulation tools for quantum classic electronic code design. Perhaps it is something similar to having electromagnetic simulation tool in RFICs. So when you have need to when you have this um, electromagnetic structure, so one of your challenges is to have a simulator. Here also we need to have proper simulators for quantum structures. Then at algorithm levels, we need to have quantum error correction because qubits uh, lose their state over the uh, state over time. So they need some kind of quantum error correction. And at the end, we need to have uh, this development of quantum processor with this control circuit. And then we should see how uh, this quantum computer can be realized as low cost and compact system so that they can be used in many commercial applications. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so my colleague, Professor Staszewski, will continue this talk. And if you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Reza. <clears throat> Uh, we have received some questions from the audience. Um, so the first one is by Seti Purnima, uh, who asks why you didn't mention photons to be used as a qubit. What are the disadvantages that you're not considering it? Uh, well, that's true. Photonic and quantum computing is also a popular type of uh, qubit. Uh, so you know that there are some activities in this area. There are some startups working on photonic wave qubits. Uh, but in in our presentation, the focus is on using CMOS technology for uh, implementing qubits. So our focus in, the, in that area. But photonic, yes, photonic is also an important uh, structure. Okay, and then at some point you make the step from millikelvin uh, operation to. Kelvin operation for Kelvin operation and a question by uh, Debasi Behera is what are the performance trade-offs if you move from millikelvin to four Kelvin? Yeah, that's one of the uh, most important uh, points of this uh, presentation. So, uh, in classic implementation of qubits, they have been implemented at very low temperatures, for example, tens of millikelvin. So, uh, in order to uh, be able to um, demonstrate quantum effects or quantum mechanical effects, it is necessary to operate uh, the structure at very low temperature, as close as possible to zero Kelvin. Theoretically, uh, we like to have a zero Kelvin temperature. But millikelvin has been a range that uh, is used at um, in physical experiments. So traditionally, qubits are uh, fabricated on that area on that temperature range, so there is no problem with that. But when we uh, start uh, thinking about a larger scale quantum computer, uh, it is necessary to increase the temperature so that we can reduce cooling power. So, of course, performance of qubit will degrade because we move away from uh, ideal level of zero Kelvin. There are a few papers in literature that has studied this. For example, the coherence time will degrade as we increase the uh, temperature from millikelvin to four Kelvin. That's one of the important um, um, disadvantages of using four Kelvin. But uh, other futures need to be further studied. Okay. And then uh, for this intermediate Q&A, a final question by Jay Moriale. How and what does the microwave signal control in the qubits? Can you explain uh, how it works? <laughs> Well, uh, we, we discussed about two types of qubits, uh, charge and spin qubits. For a spin qubit, uh, the frequency of control signal is uh, determined by the structure of qubit and uh, also intensity of magnetic field, which is applied to that. Typically, for, the, for typical size and uh, magnetic field, the frequency is on the microwave range. So, depending on uh, for example, we want to, we, depending on the operation that we want to perform on a qubit, for example, if you want to have a, a specific rotation, we should apply a, a microwave signal with, as a pulse form with a specific duration. So the frequency and duration of that pulse 
are dependent on the qubit structure and uh, the operation that we want to uh, perform on the qubit. So there are uh, some specific references that you can uh, check them for detailed information. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. For sake of time, I propose we um, move on to our next speaker, Bogdan, uh, to continue the presentation and perhaps we can come back to some of the questions that are still pending after uh, Bogdan's talk. Bogdan, if you can share your screen as well. Okay, can you see it? I can see it, yes. Okay, let me... If you... Yeah, perfect, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, as uh, Philip has mentioned, uh, I spent 14 years working for TI, uh, designing IC chips. So my presentation will be like from a circuit designer to another circuit designer. Uh, I see lots of parallels and as uh, Reza, my colleague uh, has mentioned, uh, the area is quite similar to uh, where we were with uh, wireless RF uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, when I started my work on RF in 1999, uh, I noticed that uh, all the circuit designers, they were going from different areas. Like my previous area was, uh, was re-channel for magnetic recording. And we were all learning about this new exciting field, which is wireless. So we had to read up on constellation theory, on EVM, uh, on, uh, on, on, on different, uh, different modulation uh, schemes um, and so on in order to design good circuits. So the same thing, we have to go through the same process, right? We need to read up a bit, uh, learn, educate ourselves uh, about uh, quantum computing so that we can build efficient uh, IC chips uh, to handle these quantum computers. So I would like to show you, uh, start with the work. So when I was, uh, was uh, when we were working in TI on these high volume production chips for radio frequency uh, transceivers and fully integrated radios in the most advanced uh, circ CMOS circuit technology, uh, we have noticed that uh, the circuits, the devices were becoming uh, very small, that we could count the number of electrons. So the question we asked back, back then, uh, can we uh, control these individual electrons? So we went to single electron device, uh, which is based on a tiny capacitor realized through a quantum uh, dot. Uh, the capacitance is on the order of attofarad. At that time, we didn't know what attofarad uh, atom means, uh, so we had to read up, look up in the dictionary. Um, in which uh, when you uh, put the electron on it, uh, it will raise the voltage uh, Q divided by C or E divided by C uh, on the order of tens of millivolts. And you can detect tens of millivolts uh, quite easily. Uh, you put the electron uh, into this quantum dot through a process so-called uh, quantum mechanical tunneling. Um, which, as Reza mentioned, uh, has no uh, counterpart in classical uh, electronics. And uh, the charge will be developed on this capacitor, uh, preventing other electrons from, uh, from, uh, from uh, coming in. So we wanted to use it. Uh, TI was the number one uh, leader in, uh, in uh, IC chips for wireless communication. So we wanted to obviously use these single electron devices, uh, quantum dots for cell phones, uh, such as uh, building uh, current references or D2A converters or uh, oscillators. So we started working on this. Uh, this is the uh, top view realization uh, using a traditional plain vanilla CMOS approach. Uh, the green area is uh, an active diffusion area uh, with a contact over here. And then we have uh, a poly in uh, red. And there is a little bit of overlap. So that overlap that we could control, we thought we could control to five nanometer squares. So five nanometer by five nanometer, that would correspond to about 0 0.3 attofarad, a very small, a very small capacitance. But uh, when you calculate the energy that uh, that electron would have, uh, the Coulomb blockade energy E squared divided by two C, that energy uh, will be uh, will be uh, ten times larger than the KT, the uh, thermal vibration energy of these electrons at room temperature. So it means that you can possibly uh, build these single electron devices uh, at room temperature and use for uh, cellular phones. So the cross section of this is over here. So we have a metal on top of this uh, polysilicon. Polysilicon is obviously connected with this uh, active area. 
through very thin, like 12 angstrom uh, thickness uh, at that uh, time. Uh, technology allow you to do that. Um, and if we raise the voltage uh, through this metal, then the electrons in this sea of gates, uh, this is like a thermal bath, a sea of gates, would tunnel uh, through this thin uh, oxide uh, into, into this poly. And schematically, we can show it uh, here. So we have a true capacitor through which electrons cannot go through. There is no tunneling. It's not possible because uh, the barrier separation is quite high. And uh, we have a tunneling, uh, tunneling barrier uh, over here. So we went to uh, physics uh, papers, especially by Likarev. Uh, we built a model, and uh, this is the result of the model at uh, zero Kelvin uh, temperature. And what you can see is that you are basically raising the voltage on this top plate of the capacitor, and you're observing uh, the number of electrons here on the y-axis uh, into this quantum dot. So electrons are coming from the sea of electrons uh, going uh, tunneling. So nothing happened uh, until you raise the voltage here on the supply to around 0 0.2 volts, and then boom, one electron tunnels uh, over here. And it takes another uh, 0 0.8 volts uh, in order to get another electron tunnel, simply because once you attract the electron, uh, that electron will prevent other electrons from coming in. So this is a very useful uh, property. We raise the temperature to room temperature, 300, 300 Kelvin, and uh, you don't see this very distinct uh, staircase pattern, but still you can, uh, you can differentiate these electrons. Uh, you can count these uh, electrons. And uh, in this case, uh, the electron energy is still much greater than KT, the thermal energy uh, of these uh, electrons. So we started playing in order to see uh, the, 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 the space. Uh, that we can uh, work with. Uh, so here is the capacitance, and uh, the capacitance is on the order of attofarad, something that advanced CMOS technology, the plain vanilla CMOS technology can, can realize. <coughs> and we have a temperature. So on one hand, you have, uh, you have energy of the electron uh, through the column blockade, and here you have a thermal energy. So obviously, this needs to be larger than uh, the thermal en energy. So you can see if we are operating at room temperature, for example, we have a few autofarad capacitance at room temperature, red hot. Um, we have the same kind of uh, energy as, uh, for example, for example, electron um, at uh, the room temperature. So if we decrease uh, the temperature by an order of magnitude, then voila, uh, we can satisfy this equation and uh, we can happily operate. Uh, 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 control individual uh, electrons at room temperature. So uh, the circuit that we realize is a differential structure over here, like we are building differential uh, amplifiers um, uh, in addition to single-ended. So um, here is a differential structure. This is the cross uh, section of this. Um, and uh, you can see uh, this uh, diagram that is used in physics uh, papers uh, where you have a bath of electrons here, you have another sea of electrons here, uh, you have an island, which is a quantum dot, and then, then you have a tiny barrier. So there is an energy, uh, electrostatic energy uh, separation between uh, these uh, barriers, something that uh, Reza was uh, talking in details. And then when you increase the voltage to a certain uh, level, uh, then you get electrons tunnels and uh, you keep on increasing the electrons and uh, you can monitor the constant uh, constant uh, drift uh, of these uh, electrons, the higher uh, the voltage, uh, the higher the rate of the tunneling uh, of these electrons, so the higher uh, current over here. So we um, had access being in TI. Uh, TI had the best uh, CMOS process technology for uh, low leakage for hand hand devices. Intel had the best process for high performance uh, CPU. So we had access to the best process money can buy uh, for high volume production, 45 uh, nanometer CMOS at that time. And we put lots of these structures uh, on a test chip. So that's a layout of this uh, test chip. Notice, uh, uh, RF uh, circuits uh, over here. Uh, this is a TEM uh, uh, photo transmission electron uh, microscope. This is a zoom in area. And you can see uh, that the active area and poly, they have the proper amount of overlap on this side. Uh, 
but it misses uh, over here. And there is no way you can control it. Uh, the dimensions are nanoscopic, right? So they are orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the wavelength. Uh, in which you are fabricating these devices. So you have to rely on uh, optical proximity correction, OPC, uh, to do this, but there is no way you can predict uh, what uh, will happen uh, to this particular uh, realization. So what we did, uh, we found a solution, built thousands of these, right? And they are nanoscopic in size, so thousands of these uh, devices uh, will still uh, occupy the overall area of micrometers and just simply go uh, through the production process, in fact, your calibration, find out which one has the right amount of uh, overlap. There is no overlap here, there is too much overlap here. So uh, we would find through the calibration that this is the right uh, device uh, to use. And we have several patents on these uh, structures. So we measured this, uh, uh, this is the V out versus uh, V in, something we were measured. Uh, you don't see much uh, single electron uh, behavior. You need to zoom in to some of these areas and you can see actually there are some uh, single electron uh, behaviors because the, the transfer function is supposed to be monotonic, linear, but it's, it, it shows negative uh, resistance, but it was being a company, uh, it was not enough to put a large number of engineers uh, to work, uh, start working on a product. So, um, we waited uh, 10 years and I got back with my former TI colleagues uh, that uh, work on this uh, single electron device project and uh, we decided that now is the time to uh, resurrect our effort. So uh, the process technology back then was 45 nanometer, now at that time 2017 was 7 nanometer uh, FinFET. So we decided to uh, start uh, start our luck uh, again uh, using uh, the same approach. And the motivation was that if we can build like Intel, Intel can build, uh, can put together billions of transistors on a single die uh, to create a CPU. If we can create one, one good enough qubit, uh, we can uh, replicate this billions of times, millions of times, right? And we can have millions of qubits uh, which are needed uh, in order to realize uh, the a practical, uh, useful quantum computer that Reza was uh, talking about. And of course, there are so lots of other issues like cryo CMOS uh, that we have to go make sure that this electronics will work at uh, low temperature. So this is a dream, right? To basically put millions of these thousands of millions of these qubits surrounded by uh, the electronics, the drivers and the detectors, single electron driver, single electron detector, uh, these qubits will uh, do the quantum algorithm uh, processing, um, and there is no crowding, right? So there is no IO crowding. Uh, so you avoid all these issues uh, that uh, other uh, approaches have by uh, simply having a two chip solution. One chip solution is the way to go, as we have found, found out in TI uh, with uh, GSM, Bluetooth, and other system uh, radios. And if you can put it on a single chip, uh, that chip is small and you can uh, actually cool it down to four Kelvin. Uh, with this uh, equipment that you can purchase from Montana Instruments. And they are very useful, uh, very convenient. Um, in TU Delft, uh, our master students were experimenting with uh, uh, putting the uh, chips uh, inside the open uh, helium system. And the biggest issue was uh, that uh, the wires, the copper wires would break. They were very fragile at low temperature. Here, there is no such a problem. Uh, everything is basically conveniently um, conveniently available. They even put magnet, uh, 0 0.6 Tesla magnet uh, in case of uh, spin qubits or hybrid qubits. And also you can use uh, uh, optical connections uh, to uh, these qubits. And the size is desktop. So if you can realize the dream of a single chip uh, QPU, then you can have uh, your quantum computer uh, on a desktop. So uh, this is the slide that Reza showed. Uh, I showed some details. Uh, basically, each uh, well, uh, the extreme well is connected also to a detector, not only to the single electron injector and uh, imposer, but also to a detector so we can detect the states. Uh, by detecting the states, we are collapsing the wave function. So we go to the pure uh, quantum state, either zero uh, or one. And uh, also, as Reza mentioned, uh, we are adding, we can keep on adding the number of uh, quantum dots uh, with uh, very little limitation. 
Um, so here we are showing the two middle uh, quantum dots, uh, which are basically uh, behaving like a uh, dual uh, double quantum dot. And we are injecting uh, the electrons. We are lowering the barrier by virtue of simply uh, changing the electrostatic voltage uh, on this gate. We lower the barrier so uh, the wave function can uh, shuttle back and forth. Uh, and uh, for example, in this in in, in this case, uh, when the 100% uh, of the wave function is in this uh, quantum dot, we raise the barrier, and uh, this electron is locked uh, over here. So this is the basic uh, properties. Uh, so let's go to uh, more details. Um, so again, we are looking at one quantum dot one, quantum dot two. The real quantum dots is a mathematical description of a quantum well, right? We have a gate uh, in between. Uh, we are injecting the electron and then we are controlling the imposer voltage. I is the imposer voltage on this gate. So we are basically uh, going, you can see going high. Uh, and then when the uh, imposer is on, the electron basically shuttles back and forth according to uh, Rabbi uh, oscillation. And we are going along this uh, uh, block sphere uh, by rotating uh, through the X uh, axis. Uh, we can also do uh, Z rotation. Um, the Z rotation is a little, little bit different, uh, more complicated. We need to put an imbalance. So we put a higher voltage on this gate, uh, which is outside of the uh, double quantum dot. We raise the voltage, sorry, we raise the voltage, and then uh, because of this imbalance, uh, there is a rotation on the equator uh, over here. Uh, we can also do the Y rotation, this Y axis ro 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 rotation, by putting pulses, bunch of pulses, right? So it's not individual pulse on the gate, but bunch of pulses, and it uh, causes the going from north to south uh, along uh, the rotation of Y uh, axis. So uh, not only uh, superposition, but also entanglement is important in order to realize a quantum computer. So this is how it is done. Uh, we have two rows of this uh, quant uh, double quantum dots. There is a interaction area. Only these two quantum dots are allowed to electrostatically interact. Uh, when they interact, uh, basically the quantum uh, states get merged. So they are considered like one particle. So we are injecting uh, an electron here in the lower uh, quantum dot. Uh, we lower the barrier, we allow the tunneling, then we raise the barrier where 50% of the wave function is here and 50% is here. And then we are injecting the electron into the upper right uh, quantum dot. We lower the barrier and now interesting happens. Uh, there is an electrostatic uh, interaction and that causes, uh, that uh, achieves uh, entanglement and it causes the C0 uh, operation. So let me quickly use this cartoon to demonstrate what happens. So we inject the electrons in the lower, uh, electron in the lower uh, left. Uh, we lower the barrier, the electron tunnels. Uh, we raise the barrier, uh, the wave functions function is locked. And we inject electron over here, we lower the barrier. And uh, now depending on the quantum state here, uh, the probability of tunneling is affected. So we have a two input, uh, two input C0 uh, quantum gate. So uh, we started uh, a uh, company uh, in order to realize these uh, ideas. Uh, we went for uh, Global Foundry's fully depleted uh, silicon on insulator CMOS 22 uh, nanometers. Uh, this is the structure that we have uh, implemented. It's a double V-shaped structure. And uh, the interaction between uh, the two electrons is done through the staging area. You see the distance over here is different than distance uh, over here. So, uh, and the Coulomb interaction uh, goes down with the square root of uh, distance. So, as Reza mentioned, uh, we went to uh, COMSOL, we published uh, extensively our findings uh, in this uh, IEEE Access uh, uh, journal. Uh, we modeled the COMSOL uh, with uh, the same parameters as we have uh, implemented them. Uh, then the next step is to get this electrochemical potential over here. So, uh, you can solve the uh, by hand uh, Schrodinger equation in order to get this uh, electrostatic uh, potential, but that's not uh, real. 
Um, so we, so we, we, we implemented the program uh, to obtain the real uh, actual uh, electrostatic potential and it took us about two weeks of simulation time in order to obtain this uh, brown uh, spot. Um, a, and of course, we need to do it for each value of the imposer, right? If we change the imposer value, uh, the electrostatic potential will change. Uh, and then we simulate it moving the quantum dot, uh, moving the electron from one quantum dot to another. So uh, this is a heat map of the square of uh, wave function, which is the probability. So it's going from one quantum dot to another. And at the same time, uh, we are going through the measurements. Uh, the measurements haven't finished yet, but they are very encouraging so far. It's uh, very time consuming. Uh, I would say uh, measurement is probably the most time consuming aspect of building a uh, quantum computer. Um, design is uh, relatively easy, but to measure these things is, is, is not, is not uh, that fun. And uh, we are getting the measurement results, which uh, which uh, quite uh, accurately predict, uh, show, uh, confirm our uh, simulation results. So more details on the measurements. Uh, we have this structure. Uh, so this is our solution to the uh, Schrodinger equation wave function using uh, numerical uh, tools. Then we lower the barrier over here by simply reducing, put in, putting a pulse uh, on this imposer. Uh, then the wave function tunnels to uh, this quantum dot, right? So this is quantum dot one, quantum dot two. Uh, so when we uh, when we lower the barrier over here, uh, the electron wave function go from quantum dot one to quantum dot two over here, and it starts oscillating. And then at 3.5 periods of rabbi oscillation, we raise the barrier energy again. Uh, we raise the energy again, and the electron now is stuck at uh, quantum dot two. And we do the same experiments between the quantum dot two and quantum dot three. So we can shuttle the electrons. So we can shuttle uh, the, the parts of the electrons from one place uh, to another. So that's the structure, uh, which Reza mentioned. So here in the middle of the chip, we have this quantum core experiments, uh, which is a bunch of the single electron uh, transistors. These are the quantum dots, right? Electrostatic operation. And notice uh, we it is surrounded by C of C, C dot, capacitive dots, uh, in order to control the imposers. These are the imposers, and these are single electron, uh, electron uh, devices. Uh, there is a quantum point contact, uh, intermediate between uh, the uh, classical electronics and uh, and uh, quantum electronics, and uh, we need to make sure that we properly reset this uh, device. And the communication with the outside world is through uh, SPI. So uh, here is the is the uh, block diagram details uh, of this uh, of this uh, CDAC. Uh, we have cryo memory. We store these patterns. Uh, we pass through the uh, CDAC, uh, we control the voltage and uh, voltage and uh, starting and ending time of this. And uh, precision is very important uh, because otherwise uh, the, 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 trans the, the relationship between the voltage and the uh, event is exponential. So we need to have a very high control. Uh, and here we um, noise shape, we pulse shape uh, this uh, in order to uh, make sure there are no spurious frequency. Uh, components. Uh, so this is our quantum SOC. It's connected to the external FPGA. Um, each uh, device has to be calibrated, uh, meaning that this quantum point contact, uh, we need to make sure uh, that all the electrons are removed and they are removed by virtue of the reset uh, device. So here uh, is a heat uh, function uh, plot uh, to show uh, the uh, operation of the reset device, right? We need to make sure that so the VGS is 450 millivolts. Uh, so um, if if the transistor here in this region, the transistor is not turned on, uh, here the transistor is uh, turned on too much. Uh, so in this region only, uh, the transistor is just barely uh, turned on in order to uh, remove all these uh, electrons uh, properly. So that's the chip. Uh, we put 28 uh, quantum cores uh, on this three by three millimeter chip. It's a it's a small chip. Uh, it's a uh, here is a chip micrograph. So it's a flip chipped. Uh, the separation between these 
uh, balls is a quarter of a millimeter. Uh, the quantum core is very small, right? It's nano, nan, nan, nanometric, uh, but the classical electronics detectors and DACs are uh, quite big. This is a pattern uh, generator. So we repeat this structure with different uh, experiments uh, 28 uh, times. Uh, we put it on the daughter card, uh, put it on the motherboard, and uh, then we put it on the cryo, uh, cryo finger over here. And the cryo finger uh, sucks the uh, thermal energy out and it provides about 3.2 to 3.7 Kelvin uh, of operation of the chip uh, operation. And it is housed in this uh, equal one uh, quantum computer. Uh, it's uh, position uh, over here. Uh, we have a, uh, a Linux computer over here. So uh, the only connection with the external world to this uh, 12 rack, uh, very small uh, unit uh, is uh, a keyboard, mouse, uh, a ethernet and, uh, and display. So uh, <clears throat> these are references uh, if you are interested uh, to read up more about uh, this uh, topic. So there will be, my understanding will be available to all the uh, listeners. And uh, in conclusion, uh, Reza and I and uh, the rest uh, of our team are very excited about quantum computing. Uh, it's a next step in computing revolution. Uh, the real world is fundamentally quantum, and for example, if you want to model drugs or model new materials, you need to go to quantum computing, otherwise the classical computer simply cannot uh, make it. Uh, quantum processor unit operates right at the subatomic uh, level, uh, so it means that everything is faint. Uh, it's easy to decohere this, and it's very difficult to set the state and read the state of this. So you have to uh, you have to uh, treat it with uh, utmost uh, care. And the quantum computing physics is well known. Uh, I would uh, compare this uh, to the case of uh, of um, uh, of uh, uh, RF uh, RF electronics or um, uh, or 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 a, or a building where we were twenty years ago with uh, with uh, with uh, RF. Uh, and the background in microelectronic is is the key. Uh, simply, uh, our industry, semiconductor industry, has invent, uh, invested hundreds of billions of dollars as part of the Moore's law in the IC infrastructure. So let's use it. Let's not build something uh, unique, something exotic, uh, to realize this quantum dot. Let's use the, the plain vanilla CMOS technology, and uh, we would like to be among the first, or first, to integrate uh, all the classical electronics uh, together with uh, qubit and uh, figure out how to make it at uh, 4 Kelvin temperature where cooling requirements are very uh, modest and uh, they can provide uh, very inexpensive quantum computers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bogdan, for the interesting talk. Um, in the meantime, some questions came in also for you, uh, so I will go through them now. Um, so can you comment on whether quantum computing is more like analog computing or more like digital computing? Uh, on the one hand, the output of a quantum computer after measurement and collapse of the wave function is digital, while on the other hand, during the computation, there are wave functions interfering with one another, which seems more analog. So can yeah. you comment on this? Yeah, so I, I like digital uh, signal processing because uh, digital circuits have the regeneration uh, properties, right? I mean, if you are close to, uh, if you are above the threshold voltage of an inverter, you basically snap into VDD. If you are below, you snap into VDD, right, to VSS. Uh, there is no such thing uh, with quantum computer. There is no snapping, right? So if you don't go there, it's like constellation. It's like a, like, uh, wireless constella symbol constellation, right? If you don't get there, there's nothing uh, getting you to snap it. You will stay there. So that's why uh, there are tough requirements on the electronics driving it. You cannot have uh, much face noise or frequency noise with uh, with uh, with uh, spin uh, qubits. Uh, you have to be there. And, it, and, and also in our case, we have to have a precise uh, voltage because otherwise the error will be there and we continue propagating that error. So I would say in that respect, uh, it's closer to uh, quantum uh, analog, uh, analog circuits. Uh, regarding the uh, wave function collapse, the wave fun function collapse uh, starts uh, during the uh, detection process at the end of the 
uh, quantum experiments. So we basically uh, do our experiments, one run our algorithms, uh, and then we detect it. We turn on this uh, detector and then the wave function collapse. That happens afterwards. So I guess it doesn't count. Uh, the fact that you are collapsing, it doesn't really count uh, towards uh, scoring points for uh, digital uh, digital uh, computing. So I would say uh, it's closer to analog computing in this respect. Okay. Uh, and then a more uh, philosophical question. Um, so you presented circuits for quantum. And the question is, did you also think about quantum for circuits? For example, people design circuits for biology and in turn, biology has inspired new circuits. I'm, or the, the, the person asking the question is wondering if you see any opportunity for quantum inspired circuits. Mm, uh, I, would, I would think uh, maybe neural networks. Right, um, not the regular. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the the current uh, name of the game is: we have the quantum structure. We have figured out something that has a potential to work. I mean, I I, I don't uh, try to portray that this is a done deal. Right, still lots of work needs to be done. The results are encouraging. This is one of many 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 uh, potential uh, solutions. Other groups are working on uh, similar solutions, but not identical ones. So we are trying to basically build efficient circuits so that we can get a quantum uh, system on the chip, right? And uh, when we will have done it, uh, we will probably start thinking, um, can we go back uh, and do what you uh, want the, what the, what the uh, uh, listener has uh, suggested uh, to build the quantum circuits? Uh, for this simple circuit, probably not, but for the neural network, yes, because the neural networks uh, have lots of potentials, but uh, so far they have been very disappointing. Uh, the performance, uh, the energy consumption of these neural networks uh, sim simply is unsustainable. Uh, they uh, they are still uh, falling short of the promises uh, that they have given us. Uh, and I would say we are kind of hitting a soft wall with these uh, neural networks. And uh, I think uh, a uh, inspiration from these quantum uh, quantum uh, quantum uh, uh, qubits, uh, quantum circuits would be uh, to change uh, the nature of our uh, neural networks. So that's that's so far the only thing I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question um, is related to the four Kelvin operation, um, single chip CMOS quantum computer that you uh, introduced, that you discussed here. And uh, the question is, how far is it from commercial usage? Uh, you're selling this now, so can you comment on this? Yeah, so we, we built uh, several. So uh, we built uh, so far two of these uh, devices, right? Um, one is in Silicon Valley. Uh, our company has, uh, we have over 20 technical staff uh, working on this. Uh, we have uh, one of these devices in uh, Silicon Valley. Another one is in UCD uh, downstairs. Uh, and, uh, and they are very inexpensive. Uh, we are basically using uh, a cryogenic uh, cryogenic uh, devices uh, from uh, MRIs. Uh, MRI, uh, almost every hospital has these MRIs machines. And uh, these MRI machines, uh, they are in millions, basically. So there are lots of companies, there is an industry uh, providing these, uh, these uh, liquid helium type of uh, closed loop uh, systems. So we can buy them uh, quite cheaply. Um, so this uh, cryo finger, uh, we basically bought it, right? Uh, the only thing that we did, we had to machine uh, are these cylinders because uh, what was uh, available for MRI didn't really fit uh, for us, for our application. Uh, but uh, building these cylinders is no big deal, right? Uh, the most uh, value added is 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 in these cryo coolers, uh, he, uh, vacuum pumps, uh, and so on. And we were able to basically just purchase them uh, on the web and uh, create. So this is a uh, vacuum pump. Uh, we we got them, uh, order them on the web, and basically put them together uh, in order to get uh, this uh, system. So so yeah, we are just like with Moore's law, we are capitalizing on the billions of uh, dollars of investment uh, in semiconductor industry. Here we are capitalizing on uh, you know maybe not billions, but hundreds of millions uh, spent on these uh, building uh, 4K MRI uh, devices. 
Okay. So, so uh, uh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, another question is: um, so you're designing qubits as well as circuits for for Kelvin operation. Um, you didn't really talk about what the challenges are for the circuit design operating at four Kelvin. So how do you how do you do that? Because the models they are not valid. The foundry so, models cannot be used, I assume. So that was our biggest uh, scare uh, when we uh, did our first uh, first design, first chip design. Uh, we didn't know whether it would be working or not. Uh, the encouraging results was paper uh, 19, uh, 2015 paper from, uh, sorry, 2018 paper from uh, TU Delft, uh, in which uh, I also partially participated, uh, which uh, basically found out, uh, revealed that uh, the advanced process technology devices work perfectly fine at cryogenic temperatures. It was the older technology devices, like 180 nanometer, that has issues. Uh, there was absolutely no problem with uh, with uh, with uh, advanced uh, 40 nanometer uh, CMOS technology. So as long as you don't use bipolar devices, you don't use uh, resistors, uh, the well resistors, everything uh, is going to be fine. Threshold of voltage was increasing a little bit, but the ID driving capability was much better. So uh, the digital circuits, uh, and uh, if you use uh, analog circuits, but in a digital manner like this uh, switch cap DAC, uh, operate uh, quite well, operate better than uh, actually at uh, room uh, temperature. So, of course, there is uh, now lots of effort going on to build, uh, provide SPICE model, characterize these devices at cryogenic temperatures. But what we found out is uh, it's pretty safe if you use advanced process technology, 40 nanometer and finer. Uh, most of these devices uh, are going to work just fine at cryogenic temperatures. And I also heard that uh, they cool down these devices to uh, millikelvin temperature. Of course, you cannot burn too much power, but the operation was, uh, was, was, was confirmed as proper. So this is less of an issue uh, that what we have figured out. But uh, two, three years ago, that was a big scare. Uh, we simply didn't know whether, whether these devices would even work. Okay, and then a final question. Um, so you um, made a step from millikelvin to four kelvin, and 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 by doing that, we're able to integrate everything on a single chip. Um, now the cooling is still an issue, I guess. So do you see in the far future an evolution towards even higher temperature operation for these quantum computers? Uh, well, first of all, um, we never uh, went from millikelvin to Kelvin. That's what uh, what industry did, but we never did this uh, because as a startup company, we cannot afford dilution refrigerators. These dilution refrigerators uh, costs, you know, uh, almost a million dollars. Uh, we definitely couldn't afford it, and they are the size of the two-story building, right? Uh, so we cannot do that. So we went directly to four Kelvin, and four Kelvin is a uh, is a uh, a liquid uh, temperature of uh, helium. Uh, so helium is quite inexpensive. You know, you can buy helium for a price of a of a of a regular wine, right? So 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 no problem at all. Uh, there is no need to go to higher temperature. For example, uh, seventy uh, Kelvin. Uh, uh, so our uh, objective was to make sure that these uh, qubits, uh, electronics definitely, definitely can work at 4 Kelvin, uh, but the question is whether qubits, we can make qubits work uh, and uh, ensure uh, proper performance, like decoherence time. Right, so once we can do that, uh, that's fine. You can reduce, obviously, reduce the temperature by running the uh, the the the, the uh, vacuum pump uh, at a higher uh, higher power. Uh, the temperature can go down to 3.2 Kelvin, but there is no need uh, to go to lower Kelvin. So, uh, one big uh, effort uh, nowadays is to uh, make so-called uh, hot qubits. Hot qubits uh, currently. Um, are working for uh, spin uh, qubits uh, at the temperature one, one Kelvin. 
So our qubits work at uh, 4 Kelvin, uh, but uh, the work obviously is being done. Uh, spin qubits have much better uh, quality, so if they can go to uh, 4 Kelvin, then everything uh, will be fine. Uh, there is no need, uh, really need uh, to go to 70 uh, Kelvin. Uh, you might save a little bit of cooling power, but the whole uh, assembly, the whole quantum computer um, it could be constructed using, let's say, Forty sixty thousand dollars, right? So, uh, so uh, you you would need to spend pretty much the same kind of money when you buy a high quality uh, classical circle, right? Uh, so uh, there is no really that much uh, need to uh, further reduce the cost. Uh, but if you can operate uh, these uh, quantum uh, machines at uh, room temperature, that will be a big achievement, right? So that will be big, but, uh, you know, we have so many problems to, fall, to solve before we even start thinking uh, of that one. Okay, very interesting, Bogdan and Reza. Thanks again for um, the presentation and all your answers. There are many more questions, but in sake of time, I propose that we wrap up today's uh, webinar and uh, I would like to thank you again for your valuable input and support for our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Have a nice evening. And uh, to all the people who attended the talk, thanks for your attention and have a nice rest of the day. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.